encourage you to go ahead right now and take your Bible and uh, turn with us to 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. Uh, grab your Bible and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We are continuing in our series Upside Down as we are looking at uh, how to live life when uh, everything is, is kind of turned upside down, when things are not as they normally are. And so 1 Peter is a great uh, book of the Bible to encourage us with how to live in the midst of a changing world. Uh, really, the, the largest portion of the letter here that we call First Peter uh, deals with practical exhortations. And uh, as we saw last week, just to remind you, these practical exhortations can be divided into three sections. Uh, the first is practical exhortations in view of our salvation. Uh, now, last Sunday, we wrapped up sort of that section as we ended uh, with verse 10 of chapter 2. Uh, then secondly, Peter deals with practical exhortations in view of our position in the world, and that's where we're going to be starting uh, today. And then thirdly, uh, there are practical exhortations in view of our Christian suffering, and we'll be coming to some of that uh, later on uh, as we get into chapter 3. But today, today we're beginning to look at Peter's exhortations for us as Christians in view of our position in the world. What does it look like to live Christianly uh, in a world that is not? Uh, what does it look like to, to live out our faith? What does it look like to, to follow God, to be obedient to Him uh, when we're living in a culture that by and large is not? And so that's what these verses deal with. We only have two verses to deal with today, and uh, we might call this message today visibly different. Um, we, we haven't been titling every message uh, through this, throughout this series, but if we were going to give this message a title, uh, we would call it Visibly Different, because Peter is going to admonish us in these two verses that we're going to look at today. He's going to admonish us as Christians to live differently. He's going to challenge us to do good in order to be seen by others, and he's going to explain why. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, have ever dealt with your own kids asking that question, why, uh, when you exhort them or you command them or you tell them to do something, and they always seem to, to ask that question, why, why, you know, why? Um, well, uh, Peter, in this case that we're going to look at today, uh, he's going to tell us what to do, but he's also going to tell us why to do it. Uh, in this case, we, we actually get more than because I said so. You know, I always thought, like as a kid growing up, you know, I hated it when my parents told me to do something and I asked why, and then they said, because I said so. And so growing up, I always thought, well, I'll never do that. Uh, and yet I find myself all the time telling my kids just simple things to do, and, and sometimes they'll say why. And more times than I'm proud to admit, I've, I've just said, because I said so. I didn't really get into the explanation of the why behind it. Uh, sometimes I've even <laughs> just explained that you, you got to do what I'm telling you to do, and I don't even have time to explain it right now. Uh, well, that's kind of frustrating for kids when they don't know the why behind the what. And there isn't always time for us to explain that. But Peter is going to challenge us as Christians in this message today and in these couple verses. He's going to tell us what to do, but he is even going to tell us why. So we're going to see today uh, that we're not, uh, we are not at our destination uh, that's what Peter's going to tell us. We're not at our final destination. Uh, we are on a journey. And in order to live as God would have us to live, while we are here uh, in this journey, on this journey, if we're going to live the way God would want us to live while we're on this journey, we, we've got to do a few things. Uh, we've got to adopt a certain mindset. We've got to fight the right battle. Uh, we have to maintain the proper lifestyle. And we have to remember a future day. Now, that final point is, is another what that he's going to give us, but it also speaks to the why behind all of this. So let's look together at 1 Peter chapter 2, and uh, let's look at verses 11 through 12 together. This is what the Scripture says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds 
and glorify God on the day of visitation. Just two verses today, but take a moment and let's pray and ask God to, to speak to us as he would have us to hear from him today. Father, we do just stop and pause and we ask that you would, we ask God that you would uh, speak to us right now in this moment, that uh, your spirit would take your word and would work to further produce in us growth and to further conform us into the image of your son. And so it's our prayer today that in these two short verses, the, that, um, that your word would be um, effective as your spirit uses it to conform us into the image of your son. And we ask and we pray for this kind of guidance and wisdom and encouragement today. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. Two verses. Uh, Scott McKnight, a professor of New Testament studies at Northern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, he actually said of these two verses that we've just read, he said, this is the pivotal passage in 1 Peter. In fact, he said, these two verses are a thematic summary of what is expounded in particular situations that Christians encounter. And we're going to see those in the few weeks that will follow. And McKnight goes on to say, Peter's essential message here is this. Live holy lives in the midst of secular chaos and let God take care of the final results. Live holy lives in the midst of secular chaos and let God take care of the final results. That's the essential message that Peter has to give us here in this passage. But we, we, we wonder, what does that look like? I mean, live holy lives in the middle of secular chaos and, and let God take care of the rest? That sounds good, but how do we do that? How do we live these holy lives, as Scott McKnight put it? Or, as we said earlier, uh, how do we recognize that we're on this journey and we're not yet at our final destination? And, and, then, and how do we live as God would have us to live while we're on this journey? So, so Peter basically gives us four answers to that question, and, and they're all sort of what answers to how do we do this. And Peter sort of answers that in four, with four points. And then the, the last one of those actually explains the why behind it. But the first way that we do this, uh, Peter says, is that first, we must adopt a certain mindset. That's the first thing. We must adopt a certain mindset. Now, he begins here, Beloved, as sojourners and exiles, he says. He calls us beloved, and he urges us to do something as sojourners and exiles. Other translations say strangers and aliens. This gets at the mindset that we have to adopt if we're going to live a holy life, if we're going to live the way God would have us to while we're on this journey. See, as Christians, we're not immigrants. We're not immigrants that have, that have come into this wicked world. Uh, we're also not residents, and we're not citizens of this wicked world. We are what Peter calls sojourners and exiles, or strangers and aliens. But we're also beloved. Uh, you see, sojourners and exiles here are, are used synonymously. Um, Peter is saying that uh, as we see ourselves as beloved by God... We also are to view ourselves as aliens and strangers or as sojourners and exiles in this wicked world. Um, this phrase here, these words used synonymously, strangers and aliens or sojourners and exiles, um, points out the fact that, that, that we're really temporary residents or travelers in a foreign country. We're really just passing through on our way to our final destination, to our home country. You see, uh, this is a, a mindset that we have to take as we live in this world if we're going to live pleasing to God or live these holy lives that Peter encourages us to live. You see, uh, such a person that is a stranger or an alien, they're a, they're, they're a sojourner or an exile, that, that they're not in their final destination, they're just kind of passing through on their way to their final destination. Uh, this kind of person has a different mentality about life than what a citizen or a permanent resident has. Uh, for one thing, a traveler doesn't 
a traveler, a sojourner, he doesn't live according to the customs and standards of the foreign country. He may abide by the laws, but he doesn't follow their customs and standards. Um, now, for the sake of not offending, he, he may temporarily adopt some of their customs. But as citizens of, of heaven, we, we may adopt some of the ways of the, the earth. Uh, we may adopt some of the customs temporarily if they're morally neutral. But, but in reality, we, we live according to different standards than, than the world does. We live according to, namely, the standards of God's Word because we are not citizens of this world. We're citizens of heaven. We're just sojourners and, and exiles. You see, sojourners and exiles, they don't get too attached to the country or to the area that they're just passing through. They have a final destination in mind, and they look forward to getting there. If they pass through a scenic area, they'll enjoy the beauty. Uh, they'll, they'll enjoy that, but they won't decide to move there. Uh, if they stop at a nice hotel, they, they don't start hanging pictures on the wall and settling in. They, they have a transient mentality that affects how they live on the trip. That, that's, that's how people that are passing through live. They don't, they don't go into the hotel. It may be a nice hotel. They may like the room, but that's not where their ultimate destination is, so they don't hang pictures on the wall. They don't plant flowers out front, right? They, 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 their mindset is different. Uh, you know, I was just thinking about that and, and thinking about my own life. A few years ago, uh, our family, we, we enjoyed a couple weeks in a row together uh, in Dallas, Texas, as I was there at, at DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary, working on uh, two courses for my Doctor of Ministry degree. And, and, and as I was there at, at school uh, getting work done, we, we were living on campus and uh, for two weeks there in, in the uh, dorm, and we'd kind of subleased that out from a, a family that was gone for those two weeks from the seminary, and, and, and we enjoyed our time. I mean, uh, I was in class all day, but after class, I'd, I'd come over to the dorm. We, we'd go get something to eat. We'd swim in the pool there. We'd go visit different places. I mean, uh, while we were there, we enjoyed our time. I worked hard on getting the schoolwork done, but, and, but we visited other places in the area too. Uh, we went to the Dallas Aquarium, enjoyed that. We went down to Fort Worth to the stockyards. We ate a few times at this uh, little local restaurant there called the Taco Joint. But we had a different mentality from people that live there because we were just there for a short time. That wasn't our home. Um, you know, we didn't get gym memberships. We didn't get season passes for the aquarium. Uh, we didn't change our driver's license or get Texas tags for our cars. We realized we were just passing through and we enjoyed it. But we accomplished the purpose for which we were there for as well. And this is kind of the point that Peter makes as a Christian, if you don't see this world as a temporary place of residence, you'll forget that you're on a journey. You'll start to think of this world as your destination, and it's not. I mean, he writes this, and he starts with beloved. And, and I think that the, the point there of beloved is that's a term that just expresses his, his love for the, the people that he's writing to and his concern for them, but it also calls to mind the idea that, that they're loved by God. They may be kicked out of, treated as strangers and foreigners and aliens and exiles by the people around them. Their social statuses in their own communities may be different. They may not have any social standing. They may be down, way down at the bottom in the way others view them, but, but they are loved by God. And yet, it's, it's because they're loved by God, they can, they can adopt that mindset that, that they're just temporary residents. And and that's what Peter is saying to us. We are loved by God. Um, we have high social standing with God. And so the point here is that we have to adopt this mindset that this world and everything it has to offer is just something that it can be offered to us, yes, for enjoyment's sake. Anything that's not morally sinful, we, we can enjoy that, but we're temporary residents. Uh, Howard Hendricks, the longtime professor at Dallas Seminary used to say, uh, most people, he would say, most people think that they're in the land of the living, heading toward the land of the dead. But the truth is, we're in the land of the dying, and this is for us as believers, and we're headed toward the land of the living. Um, another example, John, Jonathan Edwards, the uh, great uh, preacher up from New England, 
that was led a lot of the great awakenings here in this country in the 1800s as a, as a young man, Jonathan Edwards, uh, he was resolved to, to think much and on all occasions about his dying. I mean, he, he resolved to every day think about that, that future day when he would one day die and, and, and to think about the common circumstances that come with death. You know, so that might sound morbid, and that kind of runs against the grain of our day, but, but that's biblical. We're, we, we're aliens and strangers on this earth. We're, we're, we're heading toward heaven. Uh, this is not our home. There's going to be a, a, a moment in time when we do reach our final destination. And so we have to adopt that mindset, which includes constantly remembering that we aren't staying here for long. Our home is in heaven. We should live like it. Secondly, if we're going to live pleasing to God while we're on this journey, we must fight the right battle. Peter says. Not only must we adopt the right mindset, but secondly, we must fight the right battle. Uh, Here, the admonishment is to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your souls. Um, That's what he says. Look at it in verse 11. You see it right there. Abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. That's the command. That's the admonishment here. Uh, To abstain here means to hold oneself constantly back from. All right? You you mean there's like this propensity towards it, but we're restraining ourselves. We're holding ourselves back. You know, you think about a couple guys that are, you know, they they get into it and there's pushing and shoving, you know, on the basketball court. Maybe there's a hard foul and one guy gets up and he starts to go after the other one and a couple others may hold him back. Um, Growing up, playing a lot of basketball and oftentimes having a lot... uh, uh, louder bark than I was able to uh, back up physically. Um, I would talk a lot of junk, and I was not big enough to, to be able to defend myself quite against uh, the, these bigger guys that would come after me. I could beat them on the court, and I would let them know, but then if they got mad about that, it was kind of hard for me to you know, do anything about it if they came after me. I was always thankful for those others that would hold them back. You know? uh, but that's kind of the idea here, but it's, it's not others holding back. It's you holding back. And so when Peter says to abstain, he means to hold yourself back from. Um, this idea of waging war here points not to a single battle, but to the idea that this is a military campaign. It's not that we just hold ourselves back and we win a battle and we're done. No, there's a whole military campaign. There's a war that's raging. See, every believer faces this lifelong struggle against what we call fleshly lusts. Fleshly lusts, or as Peter describes it here in the ESV, passions of the flesh. And these are things that we have to hold ourselves back from. See, if we yield to them, they can very quickly and very easily destroy and ruin us. See, our sin nature is not eradicated when we are saved. We battle the flesh constantly. There are desires and passions that still come up from within us that we, that we have to fight. We can't give in to or yield to. We have to hold ourselves back from these. You know, it's Interesting, as you study through the scriptures, many who served God lived godly lives and walked with God, and many, though, we see end up later losing a battle with their flesh. Just a few examples, Noah. Uh, Noah, he right rescued all of humanity and, and rescued his family through believing God and building the ark and saving all of humanity from the flood. And yet after that, after that, Noah got drunk and was exposed to his sons, even after having done all of that, lost that battle. David, in his early 50s, we believe, a man who's described as a man after God's own heart, who defeated Goliath. David, in his early 50s, committed his sin of adultery with Bathsheba. Hezekiah, another example, he was a godly king who brought great spiritual reformation to the nation of Israel. But Toward the very end of his life, he lost the battle of pride with his fleshly passions and lost that battle, and we read about that in the Old Testament. And we've got to be careful about this. We are told here to hold ourselves back from, abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against our souls. You know, it's said that George Mueller Uh, as an aged man, used to pray publicly, Lord, don't let me become a wicked old man. (laughs) It was reported he said that often publicly in his prayers, Lord, don't let me become a wicked old man. Uh, George Mueller knew 
there was still a battle to fight. And so I ask you these questions today. What areas of your sinful nature do you fight and do you do battle with? What areas of your sinful nature and passions of your flesh constantly tempt you? What, 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 what war is being waged on your soul from what fronts, from what areas? What areas of your sinful nature do you fight? Do you do battle with? What do you abstain, your, abstain from, withhold yourself from? See, we have to fight our flesh. Peter says that's how we live a, a life that is pleasing to God while we're on this journey having not yet reached our final destination, we abstain from the passions of the flesh. And then thirdly, if we're going to live pleasing to God, we're going to live the, the, what we call a holy life, we, we must maintain the proper lifestyle. We must maintain the proper lifestyle. Peter says it here like this, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Do you see that there in the Bible? Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Uh, other translations will say, uh, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Uh, still other translations say it like this, or that they'll say, live such good lives among the pagans. So, when they speak against you as evildoers, Peter writes, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. In other words, Peter says that we as Christians should live good lives, that we should live visibly different, that our actions should be observable to those around us and should be seen as commendable, as righteous, as godly, as selfless, or, or as compassionate. We ought to live good lives. Our lives ought to be visibly different, and it ought to be noticeable from those around us so that they will see our good works and glorify God. He actually says here, we should do good to be seen by others. You may be hearing that going, what? This might say, seem strange to you. What do you mean I'm supposed to like, do good so that others will see that? I thought I wasn't supposed to do that. That might seem a little strange to you. you think I'm not, Jesus, I thought, said not to do that. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, but we think it's strange, right? We, we think, for one, we think, well, that's kind of arrogant. I mean, uh, isn't our gospel message, we, we, we think, isn't our gospel message supposed to be about telling people how broken and sinful we are? I mean, isn't the church meant to be a hospital for sinners, not a hotel for saints? Uh, and the answer to that question is yes and no. Uh, yes and no. I mean, isn't the church to be a hospital for sinners, not a hotel for saints? Yes and no. Uh, here's what I mean by that. Yeah, we are, as the church, to be a hospital for the sick, the suffering, and the hurting. Absolutely. But listen, think about that. A hospital is only desirable if it's more than just a quarantine building where people who are terminally ill go to die. Let me say that again. A hospital is only good, it's only desirable, if it's more than just a quarantined building where people who are terminally ill go to die. See, a hospital's only a good place if there's medicine and a help or a hope for a cure for whatever it is that is that's afflicting you. There, there needs to be visible evidence that people who go there get better or no one would ever want to go to a hospital. I mean, think about that. There has to be some evidence that people get better who go there. And the point of that is this for us as Christians, we who once were sick and on our deathbeds, have found a cure. Our lives are now marked by healing. Our gospel is for sick sinners, yes. But we preach as healed saints who are being delivered from our former corruption. We are to live such lives that those that are dying from the sickness of sin that are dead in their sins, would look to us and say, well, they went to this hospital and they are getting better. Jesus, Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount, we oftentimes confuse this, he did tell us, yes, in the Sermon on the Mount, not to practice our righteousness before others, to be seen of them, because he said there, if we do it, it's, it we have our reward, we have their applause. 
But the point that Jesus was making in the Sermon on the Mount had everything to do with motivation. Uh, Why do you practice your righteousness? Why do you live such good lives in front of others? Why do you uh, maintain such good conduct in front of others? It had everything there to do with motivation. Do you do it for the purpose of others seeing you to pat you on the back, to applaud you or to praise you? Then Jesus says that's not a good reason to do it. Peter Peter has a different motive here in mind. Peter wants us to live such good lives or practice our righteousness, if you will, in front of others. He wants us to do that. And he's not contradicting Jesus because his motive is different. He wants us to do it not to be seen of others so that we can be praised, but to be seen of others so God can be praised. Let me, let me illustrate it for you like this. It, it, it would be like someone who had terrible knees and, and they, just, they could hardly stand up. They could hardly walk. They could hardly move around because their knees were in such bad shape. And, 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 and finally they went and they, they had their what's considered right now non-essential surgery. And they had their, their surgery, and they had knee replacement surgery, and they worked, and they rehabbed, and they, they got better. And then the next thing you know, it's like they're, they're, they're out playing basketball, or they're out playing baseball, or they're playing soccer, or they're, 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 they're out on the dance floor, and they're, they're letting everybody see these new knees in action. You say, well, that, that could be very arrogant on the one hand. They're doing that to show off how good they are. Or on the other hand, if their motive is pure, they could be doing it for the purpose of showing others and telling others about this good doctor that they can go to, to find healing, to get their knees replaced. I mean, think about it. That's the idea that Peter has in mind here. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, and the idea there is that the people that Peter is addressing, they had unbelievers, they had pagans around them that were accusing them of doing evil. But he says, when they accuse you of that, they really have no leg to stand on, no justification for that, because if you're living your good lives in front of them, they'll see that, but not so they'll give glory to you. They'll see that, And they'll glorify God on the day of visitation. That's how we live a holy life. That's how we live pleasing to God, live in the way God would have us while we're on this journey. That's the third point. But finally, the way we live as God would have us to while on this journey is we remember a future day. We remember a future day. Now I say remember because we've been told about it, but it's a day that's yet in the future. The final phrase here speaks to the why behind the what of these exhortations. The final phrase here is about God receiving glory. Uh, it, it has the idea of, as it's written here for us, on the day of visitation. Now, there is some debate over what this day is. Uh, some believe that uh, the day of visitation speaks to the day when God visits those who see a believer's good conduct and put their faith in Christ. Thus, they would say the day of visitation is the day that that those that you live out your faith around put their faith in Jesus. That's the day God visits them. Others believe this speaks to the day of Christ's return and that there will certainly be some who have seen a believer's good conduct and have been saved as a result of that. And on that day when Jesus returns, they will with us give praise and glory to God. When Jesus returns, that being the day of visitation, there's debate over which is accurate there. Either way, it seems clear that Peter wants us to live good lives, to be seen by others for evangelistic purposes. That is the goal. Uh, Peter wants us to live publicly as Christians, let our good conduct and behavior be seen by others for what we call evangelistic purposes purposes. I've recently been reading this little book called Evangelism as Exiles, and uh, it's written by Elliot Clark, and the subtitle is Life on Mission as Strangers in Our Own Land. And uh, Elliot Clark really just takes a, a few select texts from First Peter here uh, to talk about how we, we live evangelistically as exiles. And I, I really thought it was convicting and, and challenging here, uh, some of what he says uh, about this particular passage in First Peter. 
Uh, he talks about how, you know, we as, as Christians today tend to struggle with this idea of living, living Christianly publicly or, 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 or practicing works of righteousness in front of others or, or living out good conduct to show that we're visibly different, that we're, we're literally being redeemed. He, he talks about how we struggle with that, and he writes and says it like this. Let me just read some of this to you. He says, in America, Christians have adopted a, a false modesty in our evangelism we never presume to suggest that we're actually holier than someone else. Uh, we think our gospel is more credible to others when they see us mostly like them. We've come to believe that God is most glorified and people are most evangelized when the church is either hip and trendy or when it's struggling and broken and weak. So the last thing we want to do is portray ourselves as either holy or healthy and most certainly not better than anyone else. He goes on to say, our great danger isn't being like the pious Jews in Jesus' day, doing external acts of worship to receive the approval and admiration of others. Instead, the threat to the American church is the opposite. Though equally sinister, it is a form of hypocrisy. We want to be inwardly transformed without showing any outward change. We don't want to stand out. It's as if we've lit a candle and we're trying our best to hide it under a basket. But the whole point of a lit lamp is that others will see it. Christians aren't just different for the sake of being different. The goal of our evident love and godliness is that others will recognize our good deeds, even ones they currently think are evil, and glorify the Father at the day of Christ's return. Our lives are different for a reason, to be a window display to God's nature with the dual purpose of their salvation and God's greater glory. Here, Elliot Clark says, we should recognize that the experience of exile, what we're called here by Peter, sojourners in exile, exiles, the experience of exile isn't always one where we have traditional enemies who draw lines and fight battles. They don't merely shun and exclude. Sometimes, or even more frequently, exile looks like this. It looks like good friends who want to include us in their fun, but when we don't go along with it, they scoff and they deride us for not participating in their sin. This is a little bit about what it looks like practically today to live as sojourners and exiles. He writes, this derision can occur when you decline the invitation to your friend's bachelor party, when you refuse unethical business practices, when you turn down the offer of drugs, when you won't cheat on a test, when you abstain from mocking political leaders, when you don't sleep around, when you excuse yourself from an inappropriate movie, when you won't lie about your age, when you don't laugh at crass humor, when you refuse to break the law, when you won't join in endless gossip, or when you'll, you'll miss the Sunday soccer game. When we do any of those things and more, when we're visibly other the pain of ridicule and social exclusion can be sharp unless we're willing to be different and face the consequences we'll never make those hard decisions but if we're never different how will people ever be convinced of the gospel and respond by glorifying god let me read that last statement to you one more time if we're never different, how will people ever be convinced of the gospel and respond by glorifying God? Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. God on the day of visitation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may God grant us the grace and the strength to live 
as sojourners and exiles who abstain from the passions of our flesh and who keep our conduct honorable in the sight of the unbelievers around us so that they'll see our good behavior and so that they'll glorify God on that day when Jesus returns. 